Well, I greet you today in the name of Jesus, the one that we sang about on the faithfulness of God, and I'm thankful that our God is that faithful God and that His presence is with us, and, and this afternoon, I'm thankful for the faithfulness of God for being with me today. I am blessed to be here, blessed by the weekend so far, and I'm not here because I have experience or old enough or I'm here because I was asked to address this subject and by the grace of God, I will, I will try my best. But I trust that as we look at the blessings that God has given to us, that we are reminded again that we have a vision within our hearts, like we have been taught before today and last evening, that our mind can be focused on God and who God is and that we don't water down who God is. Because when we water down who God is, it will affect our investments, it will affect our succession planning and, and all our inheritances. Who is God? The topic investments, inheritance, succession planning. Thinking about investments has been said that chocolate is one of the best investments that you can make. You can buy a seven ounce bar and it'll gain you two pounds. You do that often enough, you'll have a problem. But I trust that our vision for the kingdom of God and that if we've been blessed financially, that we have a vision to invest again in the kingdom of God. And it is our desire to reinvest and to recognize the, the, the holy God. Typically, when we think about investments, we think about return. And putting something into some place and having a return of it. But I'd like to begin this afternoon by reading Matthew chapter 19. And I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, and I'm going to be starting at verse 16. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bar bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, All these things have I done from my youth up, which lack I yet. And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus says, then Jesus, then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that rich man, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed and saith, saying, Who then can be saved? And it goes on to say that Jesus explains then, but I want to draw our attention to this rich young ruler that came to Jesus with an interest in his, in his mind of a desire to have eternal life. And he comes to Jesus and he asks, What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus gives him an answer, and he says, you're going to, you, you may not murder. He gives him, you may not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal, and you bear false witness. Love, honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. 
And this, this ruler came to Jesus and he said, everything of those that you have said, I have done from my youth. And this, this young man had a desire to know more. He had, he had within himself that he had done everything of those, but there was still something there that there was lacking. And he asked Jesus what it is. And Jesus knew the heart of this person. And he looks into the heart of this very person and he, he tells them, there's one thing that you must do. You must sell what you have. And it says that this man goes away sorrowing because he was rich. Now we see a warning that Jesus gave so clearly. In verse 23, you know, he goes to the rich man, or he, he talks to this ruler, and then after he was done talking to the ruler, and we see the ruler has left the room or the left the place, and he turns around to the disciples, and he, he, he talks to the disciples, and he says to the disciples, they were amazed, and they asked, who then shall be saved? And Jesus tells them that with man this is impossible. This, the Bible says that this man was a rich man. He had a heart condition of finance. He said he has done everything. And I, I had to think about how many times, how many of us here are here this afternoon have asked the same questions, what must we do? And I, I thank the committee for, for taking this this program, they have done an amazing job of planning this program. It is something that is pertinent to all our lives. We are faced with it every day. And is how are we handling it? But we asked ourselves the question, we can also say, we have not murdered. We have lived a pure life. We have lived a holy life. We have not committed adultery. We haven't been a thief and haven't been bearing false witnesses. But how many times when it then comes down to the subject of money, is it quiet? It is off limits. And we can say it's out there. But I want us to look at our own hearts today. When we are asked that question, are we the rich man? Jesus makes it very plain in verse 23. He says, The rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It doesn't say in verse 23, the rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he tells, he gives an example of the, of the camel going through the eye of a needle, which is, is impossible. And he's basically saying it is impossible for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven if our finances have, have claimed to be our only God. This man had a heart condition. We don't need to have, we can be, we can have $10 million in the bank and we have $10,000 in the bank and none of those can need to be rich. But we can be rich, we can be that rich man when we only have a, a dollar in the bank. When it becomes the God of our life. And that's what Jesus is telling, is giving us a warning here, that we are not to make money the God of our life. The Bible gives us lots of examples of how to use money and what, what money has the ability to do. But I believe it, had, it also tells us many places how God's expectations is of using the money for the kingdom of God. And, and it was addressed this morning. But we must understand whose money it is and what are we doing with it. If you have a company that has 
that has grown to a place that has that you can no longer wear all the hats. You will then hire a manager to manage a part of your company and you expect that he will do a good job. Likewise for God, we are only managers for his for the for the for the finances that he entrusts to us and he expects that we do a good job. When we if for those that have children, we don't have we don't Give our children a job and just expect a half-done job. Nor will God expect that of us. If God blesses us with financial blessings, I believe with all my heart that he expects us that we are good stewards of it and that we, are, we take care of what he entrusts to us. But the question that the committee had put in place, should a kingdom-focused Christian own or pursue investments? That's a loaded question. Can we focus on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of investments? Matthew, Matthew chapter 6 says, that no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will, else he will hold the one and despise the other. He says we cannot serve two masters. Either we will serve God or we will serve money. But I want to make it clear this afternoon that I believe that in verse 24 of chapter 6, he says we cannot serve two masters. We have a master God which we are to be following. But we do not need to have, make ourselves a mass or a servant to money. We don't need to have two masters. But I believe we can have God as our master. But we still, and if we're blessed financially, we still don't need to be the servant to money. But I ask the question, what comes to your mind when you think about investments? Many people think about investments that we need to have a cash asset in order to make investments. Many people want to invest with a quick return on investments and most investment managers will, will want some time. They will want a, a long period of time for you to invest your money and then rather than putting it in and expecting a quick return when there's a downturn, that's where you are. There's many different types of investments and I'm going to just share a few of them and I'm going to pass over that again. But there is investments where there is stock investments. There is when we become a, a fra fractional owner of a company and we are paid dividends on the profits. There is bond investments when we invest into the debt of a company and we expect that that company will then eventually be profitable and we have a return on that investment back again. There's investment trusts, investment in real estate, private equity funds, alternative investments, low risk, high risk, slow investments, high risk, ret uh, quick return investments. What is the right investment that Jesus would want us to invest our money in? And would Jesus want us to invest? Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. It's for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who has called his own servants and delivered unto them his God, his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, another two, tal two, and another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. 
Then he that received the five talents went and traded with them. Traded with the same and, and made another five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. And he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid the Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so that he had received five talents came and brought forth five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside, gained beside them five talents more. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler, ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee the ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art heart, a hard man reaping what where thou hast not sown and gathers where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. And lo, thou hast that is thine. And the Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I strawed not, that thou receivest, that, that thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and to them at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ta ten talents. And I'm going to stop reading there. Jesus was referring to, was possibly referring to gifts that he has given to, but I also believe that he has, if he has entrusted to us financially that he expects us that we put that money to use but that we put it to use for the kingdom of God and and it was it was has been laid out very clearly already that our hearts must be in a place where we recognize who God is in order for us to invest properly Jesus doesn't just ask and doesn't just Give us financially and expect us to sit around with nothing. I believe he expects. I believe he, he, the Bible teaches us to invest. But are all investments Biblical. Are they all for the Christian with the kingdom focus? We live in a world today where there is a lot of pressure for riches. And some of the investments that I had mentioned, whether it is stocks and bonds and, and private equity funds and all those different investments, I believe sometimes we need to be careful where our money goes to work. Because there is places, there is pressures for investments that go directly against biblical principles. I just, I'm just thinking out loud. Some of the investments that are out there go directly towards military. We, can, we could be investing into a company that is producing product for the gay rights movement. And I believe for that we must be careful that our investments go into place and that they go to work, that it lines up with our personal lives. God wants us to invest. When and how and should, should we invest? Should we borrow money to invest? Should we wait till we have some, some to invest? 
I believe if there's anybody here and, and there's, there's some older people, there's some younger people, but there's, if, and if anyone has bought farm properties, home properties, you have most likely borrowed money at some time to invest into real estate market. You didn't have money, you borrowed money to invest with the intent that it will give you a home. It will obviously give you a cash asset at some time. And not everybody, not everybody buys or owns a home, and then that's totally fine. But we all know, as, as, as Mennonites, we know that when we rent, we are filling somebody else's pockets. And that kind of goes against the Mennonite culture. We don't like to fill other people's pockets. We like to fill our own. But God calls us to invest. He calls us to use the talents that he has given to us. And if that's not financially, it will be in something else. But God asks us to, to use what he has blessed us with, whether it is finances, whether it is, is gifts, that God can use you in the church. He, he expects that we use it for his glory. Many people today have invested into farm businesses, farm operating businesses. They, they do that to create a cash flow. Is it wrong? Not at all. None of us would be here this afternoon if no one would ever have a profit. But the profits that you have had have ob obviously been invested into the kingdom or we would not be here. We would be doing something else today with the money that we've made. I believe God, in, uh, God expects us to invest, but invest into the kingdom. We can, we can go down the path of investing into buying a cow, buying some feed, milking the cow, selling the milk, and it creates a profit. We've made an investment. We buy raw materials, we manufacture a product, we retail the product, we expect a profit. It's, those are all investments. If we have no investments, we will never have a return. But we need to use the investment, the return on the investments for a kingdom focus. And it can be used very effectively in the kingdom of God. We can see in our world today how many people who, know, who have no desire, who who are like the one that got this one talent and they dug it in the ground and they waited for the master's return and there was only that one talent there. Our society is filled with people like that, that they, they simply live for the paycheck, they spend the paycheck and they pay the rent and the cycle continues. They are using it for self and not for the kingdom of God. And we know all too well the outcome of many in that way. But like I said, there's, there is two types of, in, there's two types of people, there's two types of investments. One of those investments we possibly put into business or farming investments. And maybe we are, maybe we are working as an employee and we have a paycheck. And I believe then at that time it is, it is also important to invest. The world is crying loudly for that money. But when that money goes into a portfolio where it creates a return back, which you can then give to the church different missions and to use for the kingdom of God, I believe it's important for us to instill that into our children, into the next generation coming on, how important it is that our money is invested and that the return of investments gets used for parts of it for the kingdom of God, but that it is all God's.
So I think about the question that was asked, is a tax-sheltered investment suitable for the Christian? I don't believe that as a Christian, we, ever, we are ever called to evade tax. But I believe there is programs in place, like the 401k, like the RRSP in Canada. There's many programs that are, a, that are put in place for those to invest at a high tax level to later withdraw at a lower tax level, and it allows, that allows to pay in and, and be a part of financing the kingdom work much longer. There's many investments. There's only one investment that we can invest in. That will last in eternity. And that's when we invest our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we recognize the Lord for who he is. Now there's one investment that I am going to I think as a Christian, and I have a burden for this one investment that is, is being, seems to be pressuring into our societies today. And I think of when we think of an investment, we put money into an account, into an investment account, and that continues to grow until you you, it comes to the date of maturity, and then that is what you have. But the investment that I am talking about now is the investment into a life insurance program. Personally, I believe that it's biblical to invest, in, make investments, returns on investments, and we can use those for the kingdom of God. But when we invest into a program that becomes a part of a lottery ticket when I pass away, is that biblical? If I buy, if I invest, and it is, in, in Ontario, it is, it's high pressure to have, whether it is 500,000, whether it is $5 million. But to invest into that. And then at the end, when it, if it lasts one year or 25 years, it's a lottery for my children if I pass away tomorrow. And the question that I have for you to, to, to challenge yourself this afternoon is that God's plan for you to be here investing into a lottery ticket after we pass away. I'm going to leave that with you. Personally, I don't believe that it is God's plan. I believe investments, there is many places in the Bible where it talks about, about uh, investing and returns. But I believe that is not God's way of investing. The question we need to ask ourselves, are we investing so that we can have the North American dream life? Or are we investing so that we have a cash flow into the kingdom work for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Again, it comes to the heart condition. If we have of, of the rich man, and who is the rich man? 
And my mind goes to, I believe it's in, in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 or 8 where that, the, uh, the uh, Simon was, was, a, was a person that had lots going on and he was a, he was a rich man. People respected him and he was, a, he was a sorcerer. He did many things to heal people. And he came to the Lord and he was baptized and then he saw the disciples, how they were healing the sick and how they had the Holy Spirit within them. And he, and he reaches out to them and he says, give me that so that I may, because he was seeing his prophets decrease. And Peter was there, I believe it was Peter that said, thy money perishes with thee. Too many times we put money in the place where we should have the gospel, where we should have God in, we put our money in place. We must be careful, we must exercise ourselves that we have God in the place where God belongs and money in the place where money belongs. Is it beneficial for us to have a focus to be debt free as soon as possibly, as soon as we can possibly reach that milestone? Is it beneficial? There's many, pl- there's many. Advertisements. There's many people that are advertising, whether it's debt free by 20, debt free by 30, and they advertise it. And the reason that they are debt free by 20 or debt free by 30 or whenever that is, is most likely because it's the interest of other people paying into them to find the information what it is. They they are selling a program. I believe it should be our goal in life to reduce debt and to be debt free. But that we do that as a stage, not as a, as a goal, a focused goal in our mind that is the only thing that we can live for. It's, it's, a, it's a beauty of brotherhood. We cannot... In our, in our Christian day schools, there is those that are just starting in school and there's those that are, that are exiting school. There's those that no longer or don't have children in school yet and everybody can pay into that fund to make that fund work. There is those that possibly have a higher debt load than what it allows them to pay for their student. But that is the beauty of brotherhood. There is those that have a low debt rate. There is those that, have a, that are just starting out in life and maybe they have a higher one. But I believe it should be our focus. Not our main focus, but I believe it is proper to have in our vision reduced debt, no debt, but then use it for the kingdom of God. We come to the place of succession planning. Again, it comes to where is our heart. And as I studied this and I thought about it, Succession planning, many of us, many people think about succession planning as as kind of that end-of-life phase. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 28, there's two verses that I'm going to read there. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Jesus gave an instruction here to go 
and teach nations, teaching them. First you go, and then he, he gives in verse 20, he tells them, teaching them to observe all things. In order for the gospel to spread beyond the life of Jesus. And Jesus could have. But he put, implemented people, he implemented the disciples into take the gospel after he, was, after he had ascended into heaven. Jesus laid that out for us. Scripturally, for the ongoing of the church. And when you have invested into whatever you have invested in, I believe it's right and biblical to have a, a succession plan. To plan for the future of your business, for the church, for the, for the mission. Succession planning takes time. No church ever continues without progressive leadership. No business ever stays going without leadership, without leadership development. No mission ever is going to continue if we keep the people that have always been there. Sometime it will stop. Jesus lays it out. When he, made, when, he, when he called them to come and become fishers of men, was it part of a succession plan? And there's many others. I, I think of, of Moses. There was a succession plan in place for him as well. But one of the key things in succession planning is, is to do it well in advance. Too many people wait as, as kind of that last thing is we, we have to get somebody in place yet. Do you start to raise your children when they're 20? Or do you start when they're young, from birth? Too many people wait till they're 20 to start raising them. And coming down from Ontario, you know, and, and I know the, the politics side on, on the American side and a Canadian is no better. But when there is two people that are 80 years old, is that a succession plan? We need to start if there would be a, a succession plan in place, there would be those of many different age categories coming into office. And it's happening in our lives. We need to have a succession plan coming into place at the beginning, early stages. Jesus didn't just go until, until death, or until he was at the end, and then things would have, and I'm looking at this as a, as, a, as a human perspective. Jesus could have done it without the disciples, but he put the disciples in place to bring them into fishers of men, to continue the gospel, to continue on, and likewise in our, in our financial, in our businesses, in our churches, in our missions, we can, it is, it is part of a succession plan is to implement leadership. And then when we all pass away, all the financial asset and earthly wealth we've accumulated needs to be taken care of. And the question that was asked is where should it go? I believe 
There's many families. There's many enterprises that have come to a, a wreck when it comes to that end inheritance. And I just want to lay out one thought this afternoon. And this should maybe be somebody that is, is much older, but I believe a part of our succession planning and inheritance, they kind of go side by side. If we do not have any succession plan in place, there is no leadership, there is no vision instilled, and part of that succession plan is to instill a vision into our children, into the next generation, into your business partners of what, where you stand so that that vision can continue on. And when we just live and we just stop, your vision will most likely stop. And when you come to the end of life and you end that 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 inheritance package is then before you. And you have never, and we have never instilled anything into our children, into the next generation, wherever that inheritance may go. Your vision will be lost. My vision will be lost. And most likely the money that is then inherited will not be used for the kingdom. I believe it's, it's practical for some of the inheritance to, move, to continue to move on, whether it is in your, to your children or grandchildren. It can be what you have built up can continue to grow the kingdom of God Rather than starting over, every generation starts over. It can grow to continue to grow the work of God. But one of the things that we must have in place is to keep our vision alive. When our vision is not passed on, I believe at that time, the inheritance has no value to be passed on. In short, an inheritance to, give, to be given in a biblical way takes much longer to make it beneficial than just when the will is opened. I believe it is something that as parents, we will work for an entire lifestyle to instill that vision into our children so that the, the finances, that if the, if the finances get passed on, so that our visions can continue to pass on in our Christian life, whether it is in your businesses as well. But that if you are passing on your business vision, that the, the part of your, if you have a vision to continue the work of the Lord, to continue missions, whatever that organization may be, but that you instill that vision into the, into the next generation. Is investments biblical? I believe it is. Succession planning and inheritance, biblical. I believe it is, but it has, it's a life long journey. There's many investments that want a quick investment. I believe God entrusts to us to invest into a long-term investment, which is the kingdom of God. In closing, I simply want to encourage us challenge us that if God blesses us with the generation moving forward that we have a succession plan in place 
Like Jesus called the disciples to himself so that the kingdom, can, the kingdom of God can be preached. But unless we have a succession plan, both our, our financial vision and our, our godly vision will die. May God bless you as you continue to serve. Continue to give as God blesses. God bless.